Okay, everyone is, um, we're at two o'clock, 201 actually. And um, just to let you know, I have muted everybody as you came in, but you can unmute yourself. I just do that so that uh, any background noise doesn't disrupt John, but he may want questions. And so if you- Oh, if please, you question, please interrupt at any point. Yeah, be, be sure to unmute and then re-mute yourself to ask the questions. And with that, uh, we'll turn it over to John and you tell me when you want to move forward with uh, which slides and all. Well, thank you. And I think my the title of the of the talk today is uh, is self explanatory. Most of these recipes um, I have I have worked on um, and done dozens of times, but not during a year more than once or twice. So the between times that I've done these recipes has been a year. And so I have kept very careful notes to try to um, to try to replicate what it is that we were trying. I was, my son was asking me what I was going to talk about, and I told him the fudge and the peanut butter fudge and the Chex Mix and so forth. And he said, I can't tell you over my lifetime how many Christmases have been ruined by a failed, one of those failed uh, recipes. You know, your, your fudge, you just it won't set up or it's crumbly or one thing or another. So he said, good for you if you, if you can do them repeatedly. So I made the peanut butter fudge just the other day. And I told him, I think it's the best ever. Uh, all thanks to carefully, precisely meeting the temperatures, meeting the uh, ratios of the ingredients, and I have very high confidence now I can do that recipe every time. And, they, and so I, I, I'll, I'll tell you that all of these are difficult physically. Some of them take huge, strong stand mixer. Uh, some of them take a day of proofing yeah, they're uh, and they're, they're difficult. Uh, but the the procedures that I, I'll show you that I've gone through with these things, such as a creaming method for cakes, you're going to see over and over and over. Every time you every time you do a, a quick bread, you're going to see the creaming method. Every time you do a a, a, a layer cake, pretty well, it's going to be a, the creaming method. And the recipe that you are using will go through the process. You know, cream the sugar and the butter together, and then add the eggs, and then add all the dry ingredients to that and voila, you have your batter. But um, knowing how to cream will save you a lot of problems in uh, all the other recipes that you do, knowing how to proof and, and so forth. So that's, so the, I think each one of these recipes is, is uh, instructive and a good technique to know, and you're going to see it over and over and over because they repeat themselves. So let's go, let's go on to the very first thing. I want to, with, with my holiday recipes, I want to find that wonderful experience that I once had with something such as hot chocolate. If you just, you just go to the shelf and, and buy a box of, of hot cocoa mix and mix it with water or milk or something, I think you'll be disappointed. I think these I, I tried to find, you know, one that is satisfying, but it never is the great chocolate experience of a of one that includes both cocoa powder and chocolate in in the bars or chips. Uh, it needs those things, those two things. So here is here are some ratios there. Uh, for for a uh, four cups, four a quart of hot chocolate, uh, cocoa powder, Dutch process cocoa powder, uh, high quality, and um, and sugar, and then and then chocolate chips or or a chocolate bar chopped up and heated, and that's that's a wonderful thing. Now you can go to Christopher Elbow and you can buy some very very high end chocolates and have a fabulous. Uh, cocoa or hot chocolate experience, but you can also do it at much more reasonably priced with just store-bought mm -hmm. cocoa. So there you go. Ne next one, please, Jonathan. 
Uh, here is my favorite, all time favorite dessert. Uh, my son was drinking coffee with me this morning and I was going through this, uh, this recipe. It comes from the Pie and Pastry Bible by um, Rose Levy Berenbaum. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I apologize. Uh, always I get in trouble during the holiday season, Easter or Christmas, with some of these kitchen phrases that are irreverent, frankly irreverent. And, I, and so I do, I hope my, my grandmother, my very strict Baptist grandmother would be appalled here at the holy season to, uh, to, to call something a, a, a pie and pastry Bible and, and shame on Rose for doing it. But she also put out the cake Bible. <laughs> If you do not know this pastry chef, and if you do not know these two tomes, then um, let me introduce you to them. They, they're the serious, real, real deal. Pecan pie is impossible. Uh, if you just pick a recipe off the internet or pick up Better Homes and Gardens and try to do their pecan pie, it will fail. I guarantee you, it's so it's so important the texture of that filling, and so Rose goes on page after page after page of instructions on how to do it. I think the next slide has. Um, so here here it is. She she tells you that you need five point five ounces of pecan halves, and you need two point six ounces of egg yolks, not 2.6, well, I mean, not three egg yolks, actually it'd probably take you four to get to 2.6 ounces, but uh, I'm telling you, the ratio here is very important. She also calls for dark corn syrup or a product called Lyle's Golden Syrup, which I've never used because I love the flavor of this dark corn syrup. She calls for light brown sugar, 3.75 ounces, two ounces of butter, heavy cream vanilla. And if you carefully measure um, this, bring this to, bring this syrup to 160 degrees, 160 degrees. And she's not kidding about that. Uh, put the pecans, I think the next slide has the, has the process there. So you combine all this stuff and you, and you put the pecans in the in the crust. And, and Rose, by the way, uh, insists that you use a tart shell. I don't, I don't. I just use a regular gluten-free uh, pie shell, uh, frozen, and this is marvelous and works great. So then you bake it for 20 minutes, just 20 minutes, cool it for 45 minutes, and you can cut it and it stays, it doesn't run out. It's perfect. It's absolutely a marvelous thing. I don't make it for my family anymore because uh, only a couple of us uh, like it. Uh, so I'll tell you though, that if you've been looking for that great pecan pie experience that you may have had all, uh, rarely and you wanna recreate it, here, here it is. Okay, let's see, let's see what's next. I, I wanted to talk apple pie because, well, mom and apple pie. I mean, what you, you need to have an, an apple pie in your repertoire. This is the best pie my family says they've ever had anywhere. And it is, it comes again from the pie and pastry Bible. And it is, the filling is marvelous. Just make the filling and put it on ice cream. You don't have to have crust on this. It's, the filling is just so, so good. And the crust is one of those flaky crusts, actually sour cream in it, sour cream flaky crust, that is the best pie experience ever. So I'm telling you that Rose's pie crust and apple pie filling is absolutely wonderful. So let's see. Let's see how you do that. First off, the my favorite uh, apple and this filling right here, which which everybody raves about, uh, is, is a golden delicious apple. You knew, notice I do not use Granny Smith's as recommended apples, although many people do. 
My favorite is Golden Delicious. It is a very sophisticated flavor of a baking apple. It's not a good uh, apple to, to, to put in your school lunch. It's mushy, but it bakes beautifully. You'll see in all the serious baking recipes that they, do, they call for unsalted butter, and then they add salt. But they add a precise amount of salt to get the flavor that exactly right. Whereas the amount of salt in our salted butter is uh, can vary. And so, uh, peeling apples. By the way, I use a parent. I use um, a, a peeler if I have a lot of them. I just use a paring knife if I'm only going to do an apple or two. But this this calls for a big pile of apples, and so paring knife and a melon baller to take it out. You'll see, you can see how the melon baller has taken the core out there. And it's really good tip, good technique, I think. Uh, next slide, please. So here's, here's what you do with that pie filling. You, you slice the apples, you ma macerate the apples with the, uh, with the spices, you know, usual spices of cinnamon and um, sugar. Um, and, and then you, in a bowl, you uh, let them sit for a long, long time. And then you put the apples through, uh, just running through a colander there and, and save that luscious um, jus and then add butter to it and simmer it until it gets a little uh, syrupy. So we're just getting the water out of there and making this a syrup. You see how I've cored the apples. You see how I've used a melon baller. And then I cut the things out and then I can make pretty uniform slices. You want to uniformly cut so that you, all the pot, all the filling has the same texture as it makes the same length of time. Okay, and next next slide, please. Now, the, the pie dough is really, a difficult thing uh, to to deal with uh, since we we don't do it every day. And if you do it every day, of course, it's, it, it, they they always look good and bake well. But since we don't do that, um, I, I don't spend time building a mealy pie dough that will flute and look beautiful because they're tough. They can be crispy, but they're just not, they just don't eat very well. They, the only purpose for them is to get the filling to your mouth. <laughs> uh, I, I don't mess around with mealy uh, pie doughs from scratch. I buy them and, uh, and often prefer them because of quick and the pie doughs is, is a minor thing. But if you want a pie dough that is fabulous to eat, then you got to go for the flaky pie dough. And they are not pretty. You can't flute them nicely. You can't, it, it just, they're just ugly. I'm sorry, they're ugly. But the taste is well, well worth it. And that's what Rose has chosen for this particular pie dough. So let's, let's go to the next one. Um, and it, and you, you make a flaky pie dough in, in a food process, a very nice uh, way of doing it. Freeze the butter and you pulse it. And then you can see how crumbly it is. Put it in a heavy plastic bag and knead the bag. This way, your hands aren't touching the butter and you're softening it up. It stays, it stays hard. It's really wonderful process to knead this dough into a bag. And you can see on that third shot that I have gotten it formed on the outside of the bag into a disc. And you keep that bone chilling cold, get that thing really, really cold. And the next slide will show you how we're going to, how we're going to form it. This recipe that I'm going to, uh, that we'll post makes two crusts, one for the bottom, one for the top or a lattice. And um, you don't evenly divide the dough. It takes a lot more dough for the top than it does for the bottom, surprisingly. Uh, and we'll, I'm going to show you how we rolled it out. You can see the, 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 the butter in there is big, big flakes. And it forms a, a million different layers like puff pastry. And so it's very flaky and delicious uh, 
of flavored with the sour cream and the butter and all that and the browning of those things. So the way to do it, the way to work this pastry is to keep it cold as it can be. And um, and you have to practice this technique. So next slide shows you how, how, it's, how Rose recommends that you do it. In the upper left, you can see that the bottom layer there is in the is in my pipe uh, pan and the amount of apples is mounded up. It got, got to be mounded up there because as it bakes, the apples will uh, reduce down and the pie will end up flat. But uh, if you don't have enough apples in there, it, you, you're going to have a sunken uh, thing. So now you can see how I've put uh, parchment paper down. I drew my diameter on the parchment paper. Then I put uh, a layer of, of plastic wrap down. I put the dough disc, the disc of dough, hard as a rock, in the center of that and put plastic over the top of it and then roll with a rolling pin, roll this dough out to very thin to the diameter that I need. And I never take it out of the plastic wrap until I'm ready to put it in over the top of the pie. I pull the top layer of plastic wrap over. I pick this thing up by the plastic wrap, I never touch it with my hands and lay it on top of the pie. And that technique is really the only way I know how to work a, a flaky pie crust uh, because it's so sticky. It'll stick to your rolling pin. It'll stick to your countertop. It won't, it won't be uh, presentable. So this, this technique works. Okay. Now we've done food processed pie dough. And now the rest of, the, of these uh, things I'm going to talk about are, are from a big, strong stand mixer with one of the three classic uh, utensils. Uh, and, and you're going to see in every, in every recipe, I'm, I'm using a dough hook, I'm using a whisk or, or that wonderful flat beater. Most, thing, most of the time I use a flat beater, almost everything. But uh, though the dough hook is essential for bread and really heavy doughs. And the whip is very essential for volume, developing volume, as we did during souffles and so forth. Okay, so let's, let's go on and see how to... Here's, the th here's a dough on the dough hook. This is the pandemi that uh, Julia Child is most famous for, and I have that recipe for you. The one in the upper right is a creaming method dough batter that I, I use for coffee cake. And the bottom one was uh, from the souffle discussion that we did. And that's uh, egg whites, uh, a lot of egg whites, I think five, uh, that develops uh, the, so well with the whisk in that in the bowl. Shape of the bowl is real important. Okay, next slide, please. Now, before I go on, I wanna talk about uh, whipped cream. Uh, Rose has a whole chapter <laughs> about, I don't know, 20 pages about whipped cream in all of its different forms. And, and we love it so, but the problem with it is it won't, it, it waters out, right? You put whipped cream on something and it in minutes, it's slacked down, it's lost its shape, it's, uh, and, it, and water is running out of it. And, and so disappointing. Um, so there's a process here to whipped cream in a food processor. It's startling to think, what? It's not going to develop any, any volume to speak of. You know, whipped cream is so dramatically light and fluffy. But if you use a food processor to do your, to, uh, to whip it, so to speak, it develops into a wonderful thing that you can put in a piping bag and pipe, and it will stay in that form for 24 hours in the refrigerator. So you can garnish all your pumpkin pies and all your pecan pies and everything with whipped, beautifully sweetened whipped cream, vanilla bean, and so forth. 
uh, flavorings there to make Chantilly cream that you can pipe. Oh, it's wonderful, a wonderful trick. And this was our, this was our Thanksgiving, uh, the pumpkin pie, I said, the pimp, chiffon pumpkin pie that I, I think I gave you uh, last time we talked and the Chantilly on top uh, of it, real, a real hit. Okay, let's go ahead. Here is a, a coffee cake that I've been making for a number of years. I, I make it in a springform pan. And if you don't use springform pans, they're tricky to use and tricky to clean. And, and the, the one thing that I, I found that helps me the most is to line the bottom of the springform pan with parchment paper. And this is just something I've been doing the last few years and it sure does help. It helps to release the, the uh, coffee cake from the bottom of the pan. It helps with part, uh, portioning it. it, it uh, it's, it's great. And it absorbs some moisture and, and uh, helps the bottom get uh, keep from being soggy and so forth. So that's really helped a lot. And I took it out of the springform pan, took the sides off of the springform pan so you could see uh, that uh, coffee cake. This coffee cake texture is much more moist than most of them I've seen. It has a, a lot of, of um, sour cream in it, and, which is a secret ingredient. And um, it, it's done by the creaming method, which is why I, I mentioned it. Let's go ahead. Here's, um, here's the, every time your recipe says, uh, cream the butter, sugar, and eggs together, watch out, because they are leading you down the wrong path. You don't want to start introducing eggs until you have formed a nice emulsion between the butter and the sugar. And the way to do that is to have butter at just the right temperature. Too soft, it will break. Too hard, it will break your beater. I, I know a, a professional chef who was almost fired and was fired later uh, because he broke an $800 beater just like this, only about this big, um, on butter that was too cold. Usually they let the butter rest out at room temperature for a number of hours to get soft enough to use. He didn't and broke it. Uh, so, so watch out. Uh, butter too hard will damage your beater. And butter that's too soft will break. So it's going to be just right. Um, I don't know how to describe it. You'll see if you've broken your, your sugar cream method that it was too warm. So air on the side of just soft enough to beat. I don't think super fine sugar is, in, is particularly important. Um, it's handy for iced tea or something like that, but in recipes, just another few seconds and granulated sugar it hit creams just as well. So I, I don't, I don't, it's just, it would be another thing on my cabinet. I don't need it. I'm fine with granulated sugar. Once you get this to where it looks somewhat like this, now I have already started here adding the egg in small increments and you incorporate the egg in that. Then once you've done that, the next thing is you dump in all of the dry ingredients and blend it up and voila, there is your batter. Go ahead, uh, please, Jonathan. So on the left, I have the butter, sugar, egg all going there. Looks like the beater is really going fast. It is not. Um, and then in the top right picture, I have added all of the dry ingredients and look at that fabulous texture. All because the butter and sugar were creamed together, were not broken. And so the, te the texture of that uh, batter is very uniform, very smooth, and all of the ingredients are incorporated throughout that batter, not. And, and um, so um, now streusel is an, often uh, with nuts, sometimes without nuts, but in, in this particular case, uh, you put half of the batter in the bottom of the springform pan and then a layer of streusel and then the second half of the batter on top of that and then streusel on top of that and then it bakes 
and um, it, this is a, a quick bread. So there's no, the leavening in there is chemical baking powder, baking soda, not, not a yeast. Okay, next, next one. So that's coffee cake. Banana nut bread, the same, exactly the same. Uh, creaming method and just baked in a loaf pan. Um, I, I have this recipe. It has many, many ingredients that are odd that you would not have in a, in a kitchen where you, you don't cook gluten-free. So it has rice flour and it has potato starch and it has uh, uh, guar gum, you know, and, and so odd ingredients there. I'm happy to share this recipe because it is the best banana nut bread yet might have eaten. It's delicious and it slices beautifully and it's just a terrific thing. The secret for your banana nut bread is if you don't have sour cream in there, I recommend take a very uh, ripe banana, put it on a flat plate, put a tablespoon or two tablespoons of sour cream in, in it. It, is, it, it makes the banana so much more sophisticated and it enhances the banana in, in ways I don't understand, but it really works on it. It's a great tip, trick. Okay, let's see. Let's see what's next. Here's this famous bread I just read the other day that uh, when, when they went into uh, to, to transport Julia Child's kitchen to the Smithsonian. Did you know it was in the Smithsonian? That wonderful kitchen that she used on the set, uh, the set, I think, of her PBS uh, special uh, shows. Um, the, on a clipboard was this, was this pond of meat. And, uh, and so I thought that was great. I started looking at that clipboard and it's not the pan to me recipe that she, that she included in her book, uh, Julia Child Cooks, which is where I got my, my Julia Child recipe. So she had adapted it uh, later. Uh, it didn't, it had about half the number of ingredients that this, that this one does and made it much smaller loaf. So, so what is pan to me? It, this is, this is a dense bread. This is not a sandwich bread, and she calls it a sandwich bread, but if you make a sandwich uh, a bread, a typical sandwich bread slice of this, it's very dense. And I think you would find it to be too, too dense. But if you slice it very thinly, then it becomes a perfect base for canapes or for grilled sandwiches. Make a grilled, a grilled uh, ham and cheese sandwich with this bread and and it will be a great experience because I, I tell you, the bread will be the best thing in that sandwich, even though I love ham and cheese sandwiches. So it's good for paninis. It's good for croutons. This is the famous bread. It is so European in, in because well, let's look at the ingredients. Here they are. Now, I think the next slide is the ingredients. Very, very common ingredients. All purpose flour, not bread flour. It has enough structure. Oh boy, it does not need bread flour. All-purpose flour, a pound, two ounces of butter, a cup of milk, a teaspoon of salt, an incredible amount of salt. You would think, no, no, why so much salt? European breads are very salty and their butter is not. Where we grew up with Wonder Bread, which has no salt in it to speak of and, um, no discernible salt and salted butter. So, you know, the European style is to salt the rolls and breads and so forth. And then I use Crisco to line my uh, bread pan and um, active dry yeast, which I find very hard to work with. Uh, it's, I only use it because it's convenient and I don't use yeast very much around my kitchen. So I get these packets. It's difficult to get it to, to to dissolve into a uniform, it, it's like clay. It forms a clay. It's very hard to work with and to get it into the into the dough where it's incorporated. So, but I I, I struggle with that uh, getting that yeast in there. So the process then is to just form a dough with all of those ingredients, including the yeast. And um, in, in a very strong uh, pan with a dough hook. And then you take the butter, keep it cold, and smooth it out with your hand. 
onto a, a like a, a little cutting board or a plate. And then with a scraper, while the dough is, is developing its gluten, while you're beating the dough, then you add a tablespoon or so of that butter and, and let it incorporate into, into the dough. And it forms a very, very strong dough. Uh, it, a lot of gluten development there. Then you go through two rises. The first rise is in the, is in the beater, uh, in the mixer bowl, about three hours at room temperature. Covered, towel, put a towel over it, it helps uh, to retain the, the, the heat that the bread generates and helps, helps it to rise. So about three hours to the 10 cup level. If you, you make this all the time in the same bowl, you'll know where that is. But the first time you have to measure how far the dough has to come up. It comes up three fourths of the way on, on my five quart bowl over three hours or more. And then you take it out, redistribute the yeast and, and form another ball and put it back in the kind of punch it down and put it back in the bowl for the second rise, which can be two hours or so. And then the third rise, you punch the dough down, form it into a loaf, put it in the into the to the pan, and that gets another hour and a half rise. Those slow rise, you can do this overnight, by the way. Uh, and then bring it out, warm it up the next day. But it takes a long time to do that. I mean, it really extends the time because the, it, it, it won't rise for two hours after you take it out of the refrigerator. So start this early in the morning. You'll have the you'll have the the bread by evening. <laughs> it's a slow process, but what those slow rises do is develop a flavor that you can't buy. You just can't buy. I don't think commercial bakers make this bread because it is so labor intensive. It is so slow. It just takes forever and they don't have time to do that. So you, you can seldom find, I don't know, maybe, maybe you can buy a, a pond to me, but it, it's worth it. It is so worth it. The slices of this, you can slice it so thin and it, Texture is great. It's just it's a marvelous bread. Okay, let's go on. Let's spend enough time on bread. <laughs> uh, go ahead, please, Jonathan. There. There it is sliced. There's the crumb. It's fabulous. I know. I know that even Julia uh, talks about making it with a palm and loaf. I don't want to spend any more time on this. I don't. I just make it in a in in the classic bread shape. And then if I wanted it's, it's perfect squares, I just trim off the crust and use those crusts for croutons. But uh, I I always bake it this way. You can see how beautiful that bread is. You just you just want to put butter on it and eat it. It's so good. Okay, let's go on. Here's my Chex Mix, and you're going to laugh, uh, but this, uh, my neighbors, my friends, my family, everybody stands in lines for my, for my Chex Mix. They don't deny that I gave it to them, so I'll give them more. They won't return the containers that I give it to them, so I have to give it to them in like styrofoam cups because whatever I give it to never comes back. And it is a joy to make. It's, it uses Lowry's. I know it's spelled oddly, but that's really the way it's spelled. It uses Lowry season salt. It uses Worcestershire celery salt that I told you that I don't ever buy. And I had to go buy it for this recipe to make it just exactly like we've always done it. And, uh, and the, ch the checks uh, and of course, in my gluten-free kitchen, we don't have uh, uh, wheat checks, but everybody else does. And so shoestring potatoes, pretzel sticks, which I didn't, didn't not have for this one particular thing. Pecan, cocktail peanuts, not dry roasted. Pecan halves are important there. Cashew, pe cashew halves are okay. Halves and pieces are okay. And so save yourself a bunch of money and do that. You make this melted butter, 
put it in a really good roasting pan and distribute that butter and go ahead next slide please and um it it uh, bakes uh for an hour you stir it each every 15 minutes look how it's brown it's beautiful the one thing that i've added in the last few years my wife made this forever uh, for 40 years always uh putting it out on on newspaper i was never comfortable with that and and so i i borrowed a trick from the um catfish fry guys they just uh Rather than use a whole roll of paper towels, just put one layer of paper towels on top of new paper. That works great. This stuff lasts, uh, it will be gone before it gets stale. Make it, it'll last as long as you <laughs> hide it from everybody. It'll last weeks. It'll last months, I know, because my wife sent it to me in Korea in 1978 or Christmas that I was not home for. But I got the Chex Mix in Korea, and it had spent weeks on a boat uh, getting there. Okay. Here's a, here is the dream uh, peanut butter fudge that teaches us the really, really important technique of making uh, the, the evaporated milk sugar syrup into the right texture to where the fudge sets up and is not grainy. It's super smooth. It cuts beautifully. And it, if you do it right, looks beautiful on top. The, the flavor of this peanut butter fudge is sublime. If you use good vanilla, don't, don't go cheap on the vanilla. It, it really does need to be a Madagascar uh, vanilla and um, trust me that the, any of the vanilla flavored things don't work well and it's worth it. Uh, so let's go to the next slide. Um, here are you, you set all fudges up this way. You have the base of the ingredients that are going to be melted by the syrup. And, um, and then if the syrup achieves the right temperature, it will be just on the verge of setting as you pour it over the ingredients and inc very quickly incorporate them. This is, a, this is a timing exercise. It's dangerous because if that syrup gets on you, it is a serious burn. Uh, and the and very physical. So I use two spatulas. Um, I use um, I don't use a glass bowl. Uh, that was a mistake. Uh, it, it it cools things down too quickly. You want a metal bowl. Guaranteed, you'll have better results with a metal bowl. Uh, the as you make this simple syrup or this syrup rather with the condensed milk and the sugar. You're going to watch it flare up as it, and it's, it's going to go over the edge and you're going to have a mess on your countertop or your cooktop. Uh, so be ready, be ready for that. Stirring it all the time. We're over moderate, moderate heat. Don't go slow. You got to get it up there. And it starts to bubble, boil over. It'll settle down as, and, and then it, then this is where you're really getting close to 235. Keep stirring the edges, stirring the bottom, very important to, to watch out because once it seizes on the side, it will burn. And um, so, and we wanna get close to 235. We're using our very highly accurate thermo. Now I've forgotten the brand name of my thermometer there. Uh, but anyway, it, it's accurate to a degree. And, and now, I, now I don't have failed uh, budge because I can get to 235. With the old glass things, couldn't read it. It could, wasn't accurate. Uh, missed it. And if you go too far with this, too high a temperature with your syrup, it's going to be grainy. As you've tasted grainy fudge before. And if you don't go high enough, it's not going to set. Okay, next slide. And 
chocolate fudge the same, exactly the same. You've got all of your dry ingredients there of, of the uh, broken up into small pieces so that it melts quickly. All of your chocolate and, you know, whatever it is, milk chocolate or, or uh, coverture, uh, you bring that evaporated milk and sugar to 235 quickly blend it to pour them in a container don't st don't s try to smooth it out that's where you really ruin the appearance the top of appearance and so uh, just let it set up and then okay next slide this is the most marvelous appetizer uh, that I know how to make it looks so homely, let me say. This is a gougere that um, you'll often see in, in small little uh, pipe like, like they're gonna be cream puffs, but flavored with cheese. And that's exactly what it is. This is cream puff pastry, pate choux. And uh, it's a delight to make with a mixer. <laughs> Not fun by hand. Uh, and it, it, you you make this pate choux, and well, let me just describe it. Cup of water, cup of flour, and you have four eggs standing by, and you have uh, two or three ounces of butter cut into little pieces. You melt the butter in the water. It's just boil it and the butter melts and you dump the flour on top of it. You would think it would just be, uh, oh, it would be ruined, but it, it comes together into a paste very quickly. By hand, you just stir it and it forms a, the nicest paste. And then you put that ball of paste into a mixer with a, a, a beater. Uh, a, I use the dough hook on in, for this particular thing. It's just too dense to use the flat blade. So I use the dough hook and you just start uh, beating that, that dough and add an egg and it breaks up and you think I've ruined it and no, it just keep beating and it, re it incorporates that into the nicest uh, dough, a little more loose, the second egg, the third and fourth egg. And it is a wonderful dough at that point where you can add the cheese and you know what I'm what kind of cheese I'm going to tell you to add is Gruyere it's the best cheese ever for this it's so flavorful so aromatic so you roll the cheese in there save some of the cheese to garnish this thing pipe it into uh this particular recipe that I'm giving you forms two six inch rat rings and then you bake it from three steps at very high temperature to get it to puff and brown. And then a second, uh, take it down from 450 down to about 400. And it bakes it at that level for about 10 minutes or so. And then you take it down to 350 and, and it gets another 20 minutes total, I think of 40 minutes uh, to bake this ring. And then you can serve it right out of the oven. You can serve it two days later you can put it in the refrigerator. It's great on picnics. It's great hot, warm, or cold. And it's just a fabulous thing. The French, the Burgundians especially, people in, in Burgundy, uh, always uh, have this on picnics and they drink red wine with it. And I recommend that. It's, it, it is a great, great thing. You can form it into the, into the little cream puff shaped things, freeze them, pull them out. Uh, it's great. I, I just happen to love the, the shape and the uh, and and the ring uh, of this. So there is my just wonderful gougere. Okay, let's see next slide. I I am moving uh, pretty good. I, I I got through the things. I wanted to go. Th something occurred to me uh, to, that I was going to mention while I was talking about bread, and that's bread pans. You notice that mine, my bread pan was like everything that I own, forty years old or more. I started cooking seriously at forty years, and I bought things then, and they have lasted a lifetime. It's just been remarkable how that that bread pan. It's of course. 10 lined steel. 
uh, you wouldn't want a bread pan made of stainless steel. It would weigh 40 pounds and it would cost a hundred dollars. So, so they use uh, thin sheets of steel. It's got a funny little rim around it of wire, heavy wire. And then to give it a food safe surface, they tan lined it. And you know, all those old French pans were tan lined and people love that, love that. But honestly, that's not right. I mean, it's just not right in these day and ages where we have these marvelous pans, bread pans that are non-reactive. They look great. They are lightweight. They're just, I, I, I looked at the idea because I, I, my, my family has seen my bread baked in that same bread pan for 40 years and they're going to treat it like it's some kind of a uh, an heirloom or something. It is not. I'm going to pitch it <laughs> uh, because the, the tanning is gone and uh, it's rusted around in the inside like they all do. So the modern bread pan is a better buy. And if you don't have a Pullman loaf pan, buy a brand new one that's the top. Don't, don't go for an old fashioned one with, that's tin lined. It, it's, it's not going to slide well. It's, the it and it, so uh, enough said there and similarly i have replaced all of my old wooden spoons and the the first generation of of uh, spatulas where you you had a wooden you know the, like the well there's one at the bottom william sonoma had a whole line for years and years we were buying silicone spatulas and things from William Sonoma with a wood handle. Oh, for crying out loud. And um, I tell you, this company, Dioro, and it's not the only one, makes this line of seamless uh, spatulas, silicone spatulas, and they win awards. I mean, everybody who has ever put one of these things in their hand said, I love everything about it. I love the shape. I love the ability to, with a little sharp corner, to be able to get into the corners of things. I love the weight of these things. I love how their dish order say they're good to 600 degrees for crying out loud. You know how many spatulas I've melted trying to do syrups and stuff uh, with the old, old days. So I recommend this brand. They're not expensive. I think that set of four is $24 or 25. And, um, and they are sanitary. There's no, there, there's no joint uh, between the wooden handle to, to collect all the dirt and everything. So, I, I really recommend it. It's a great set, and um, and and I highly highly recommend that. Let's see. Uh, I think that I think I, that's what I had to cover. Um, I I promise you recipes. The pond to me, uh, the fudge. Uh, the uh, Gougere and and any other uh, that I have here that you you would like the banana bread or the uh, coffee cake or whatever, uh, let me know. I, I'm happy to send those those to you. And then I was going to, as I started uh, saying to to Jonathan, here here is my this this is a shame because I've always. Um, Tried to tried to have all of my coursework at school with visuals and you can see I'm I'm, I'm speaking to my friends at, uh, at from school Carol yeah and so we're we're live <laughs> on TV <laughs> uh, the I've always used PowerPoint. I've always used a, a projector. I, I think it was a, one of the first guys to put a projector in a culinary classroom because I thought you could learn so much by seeing these things uh, on a screen. And so, but, and yet I haven't done that with my own, with my own cooking. So I should be able to put my iPad on my countertop and, and call up my recipes there on the iPad instead of having this big mess every time I try to find one of those things in there. So I'm gonna soon, soon have this 
digitized, organized, searchable, and so forth. And I will share that with you in the next months, maybe by summer, I should be able to get that done. I hope to do that. Any questions for me? Oh, yes, ma'am. Um, on the Chantilly, you were saying something about, well, before you talked about the Chantilly, you were talking about food processors, food processors versus standing mixers. Yes. You said on the Chantilly that you used your food processor. Is that right? Or did you it's use true. your- It's true. I know it's shocking. <laughs> Who has ever whipped cream in a food processor? Not me. <laughs> Not me. I know. Uh, and yet, and you have, and you develop a wonderful texture for okay. uh, whipped cream, but it falls. It doesn't last. It slacks in minutes. It starts to lose its shape and it weeps. And um, so, to to develop in, into the texture that you can pipe it. And it'll stay for 24 hours. Uh, Your food processor with the blade. No, I'm not talking a plastic blade. I mean steel blade. I'm gonna try. You gotta be quick. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try it. Oh, it's wonderful. Uh, you uh, be don't go away. <laughs> you will end up churning butter, literally. <laughs> <laughs> it will break into curds and whey right before your eyes. So well, just just pulse it until you develop it just to the texture of soft piece that you want. And it's more, now you're not going to get any more volume uh, that you do when you're whipping it, but you are going to have a wonderful texture. It melts on your tongue. And if you flavor it with uh, the sugar and vanilla in the classic Chantilly or what, whatever flavorings you, you choose. Uh, Rose has a chapter on I, whipped creams. Yeah, and whipped cream I'm going to have to get that book. <laughs> Um, well, one other, one other question. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Now, let me tell you that this is just as brilliant. Now, my Christmas dessert comes from the Cake Bible, and it is a pear Bavarian. When we were apprentices and had to do our graduation lunch, and one of the requirements was to do a Bavarian. It's hmm. a very challenging thing to do. You can you can make it unmold beautifully but you can't get your spoon in it. And you, you, one, one day, one of the judges was judging somebody and he said, honestly, I think I could make this thing bounce. <laughs> it had so much gelatin in it. So, or you can eat it with a spoon because it runs all over the plate. It, it's a very challenging thing, a Bavarian. And Rose solves all those problems for you. It's a marvelous <laughs> recipe. Uh, and you poach pears. Pears are a very difficult fruit because they they're ripe for one hour <laughs> right right and so timing the pear is very difficult unless you poach them and then you don't care just get get it, any old pear pick it up it can be hard as a, a brick bat and and you poach it and you make a syrup from the pear poaching liquid and that's the base of this bavarian and it's a marvelous dessert. And that's what I'm doing in that. And you have to buy the two books <laughs> of roses. I think they're at the library. I bet you they're on their ebooks now. And, uh, but they're, they're worth adding to your library. If you could buy them in paperback, do, do so. And, and buy them used, that sort of thing. Uh, because, they're very tedious recipes. I mean, a whole chapter on whipped cream. Come on, give me a break. <laughs> so my other question oh. was on brown sugar. Yes. Um, I make a Jewish coffee cake, which I've been making for eons, and everybody loves it. But with most of my recipes that call for brown sugar, I always use dark brown sugar. I just mm -hmm. find it to have a richer flavor and just, and I, is there really a big difference or is it minute? No, I'm with you uh, because the, the flavor is what it's all about. The, the, it will perform just exactly like the light sugar. It's, it is, uh, it's an important distinction for the flavor that your recipe is calling for. As an example, back to the, um, oh, not dark, 
but the light syrup, corn syrup. Yeah. Uh, Rose calls for light. Oh, no, no, she calls for dark in the pecan pie or mm -hmm. that Lyle's golden syrup that I, I and I love it's the dark very flavor. Very British. <laughs> Extremely British. It's probably best I'm for from, scones. I'm from England. That's all my mom ever used. <laughs> yes, yes, for scones and all kinds of important reasons. And I, I've worked with professional chefs who, who, who insist on it and they won't do that recipe without without Lyles. Uh, but for this particular pecan pie, I think that from to my taste, the, the dark works. And I, I'm back and forth on light and brown uh, uh, sugar. And I mean, light and dark sugar. Thank you. I, I, I love speaking to you all today about these recipes that I'm so passionate about, but they're, they're a challenge. They really are. And um, so I, I, I'm telling you, go to Christopher Elbow and get you hot chocolate rather than messing around. <laughs> if you can. <laughs> so good to talk to you. Happy new year and and look forward to talking to you next next year great thank you john thank you so much thank you thanks john bye-bye have a great holiday season everyone thank you